Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me today for our webinar, Marketing Metrics. How do you measure your firm's marketing success? If you've not met me before, my name's Michael Carter, commonly known as MC. That's a long-standing nickname that I won't give you the backstory on today. If you're new to Paradox, how we differ from other advisors to the profession is that we are inch wide, mile deep in teaching accounting firms modern marketing and innovation. We're not practiced management consultants. We'll never talk to you about banning write-offs and managing your staff and putting two monitors on your desk and all sorts of advice you've heard over the years. Instead, we focus in on what else? Relatively new ways of marketing firms. We've been going for five years now. We started just when things like Twitter and other forms of social media were starting to become legitimate business tools. And we've been teaching accountants and related advisory firms that now over the past five years. And we were the first, you can Google it if you like, the first uh, advisors to the accounting profession to teach social media strategically. But what's the point of all this marketing if you can't measure its effectiveness, which clearly is today's topic. So what we'll look at today is how do you measure it? You know, what is success? I love the management axiom that we've all heard over the years, popularized by W. Edward Stemming, of what you can measure, you can manage. Now we all know that, it rolls off the tongue, it's easy to say, what you can measure, you can manage, but what are you measuring? And what you'll learn today will flow through to your conversations with your clients, with your business clients as well. Now the flip side of what you can measure, you can manage, is what you focus on improves. I've noticed that throughout my business life and personal life. I'll give you a surefire way to put on weight, for example. Stop caring, stop measuring it, stop weighing yourself, stop looking in the mirror. So if you're not measuring it, you're not focusing on it, it's outside your conscious awareness and it may not be performing as well as you'd like. So what metrics are there? What should you focus on? We'll look at some examples today and some tools that are available to you. And I'll also point you to um, a detailed blog post that lists out a number. We'll talk about those. You can ask questions as we go today. Feel free. I'll keep my eye on the questions. Let me just pop out the question panel on my other screen here. And also our webinar co-pilot today, Isabel, who's the head of our marketing assistant team. We have a virtual marketing assistant service headed by Isabel. So she's also keeping an eye on the questions as we go. Now, your accountants, your bookkeepers, your business advisors, you clearly understand the difference between lead and lag indicators, but how are you applying that to your business? So lag indicators, the results, lead indicators, what are we doing today and this month that will produce our results next week, next month, next quarter. If you focus on the lead indicators long enough, the lag indicators will look after themselves. Back to the uh, my fluctuating waistline scenario of weighing yourself or not, clearly your weight or your body mass or even your percentage body fat, they are all lag indicators. The lead indicators are, for example, how many minutes of aerobic exercise are you doing each day? Or how many calories are you taking in? Or how many grams of fat are you consuming? You measure, monitor, track, and meet the standards on those lead indicators. And you probably won't need to weigh yourself as much or dread when you do it. But out of, there's so many things you can measure, and we'll cover those today. Which lead indicators matter the most for you in your firm right now? So what I'd like to do is start off with a poll. Let's get an idea. I'll launch this poll, Isabel. Just launch that now. It's asking how savvy are you with your marketing metrics? Now you can see that on the screen at the moment. I'll just step you through the possible responses. Answer five out of five. We have dashboards displaying our marketing metrics. So dashboards mean real time. Or we get monthly marketing metrics reports. Three, we log into Google Analytics and other tools occasionally. Or we vaguely understand the need for marketing metrics. Or lastly, not even sure 
where to start with marketing metrics. So select one of those options and then click submit. And we'll keep going till we get about 80% of you who voted. So I won't let you get away with not taking action here. We're almost there. Another couple of people vote and we'll get over our 80% threshold. And we're there with 87% of it's voted. So I'll just close that poll and I'll share the results. And what do we have? Okay, 0% have dashboards displaying our marketing metrics. So you'll be keenly interested in a tool that we'll share with you today. 21%, one in five of you get monthly marketing metrics reports. Excellent. Around about a third of you log into your Google Analytics or other tools occasionally. Another third of you vaguely understand the need for marketing metrics and 16% of you have owned up that you're not sure even where to start with marketing metrics. So if we add up the bottom two, what's that? 48%, almost half are not sure or vaguely understanding. So that's brilliant and there's a range there. Now why that's brilliant is clearly the first step in solving a problem is recognizing it. The next step is defining it. So today you'll achieve both of those goals and we'll have some practical uh, pieces of technology that you can pursue to really get your finger on the pulse. Now let's look at some of the, the marketing metrics that we know exist today with modern marketing. Website traffic. Do you know what your website traffic is? I'd be interested to see actually. And when you see me look over in this direction, I'm surrounded by monitors. Uh, I'm just looking at the, of the dashboard. So just raise your hand. I won't call on you to, to actually reveal the data or to speak to the group. Just raise your hand if you know off the top of your head what your website traffic is per week, per month. Wow out of many dozens of people here, that's this five of you. Now you well, thank you everyone who just raised their hand there. Now you know well that when you have a business operator who's on top of their game, they know their handful of numbers without having to look them up because they look at them each day and they just know where things are tracking mentally. If you're serious about the front end of your modern marketing machine, which is how much traffic is your website getting, you need to know this. Now with Google Analytics, as you're probably aware, Google Analytics is a free tool. Now most website developers, and I saw a website go live just yesterday that looks beautiful, looks great. Uh, and I can see, because we've got a few tools that allow you to see uh, behind the scenes on a website in your web browser. We could see that the SEO had not been done yet for the website. Maybe that's on the to-do list. But a lot of website developers don't bother doing their search engine optimization, the SEO for you, for a few reasons. It's a lot of work for them, so they'd have to charge you for it. Upstream from that means they'd have to sell you on it. And often they're just happy to get the website project and get your website live. But if you get a good looking website um, with the latest in technology, for example, it should be mobile responsive so that it rearranges itself into a single column when someone's looking at it on a smartphone, for example, or a small tablet. But if, if you're not monitoring and measuring, for example, how many new unique visitors are you getting each week? Well, then really it's marketing for what we call marketing for pretty pictures. Now, it's important to be a remarkable firm. You've got to look great. First impressions are crucial. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book Blink uh, shares some fascinating research about how instantaneous it is when we make up our mind about people, about brands and about businesses. So that's what your business is subjected to, those first impressions that people make. So you've got to look great, you've got to sound great. So sound great is your content. How meaningful, how educational, engaging, inspiring, motivating is the content on your website that makes people want to act. So that's not your static pages, the about us, our values, our team. That's all necessary and it's important to do those pages well. But the most important content on your website is your blog posts, your articles, your educational articles. So with that, the new unique visitors, 
that's people who are there for the first time, so it's not your staff, it's not your existing clients, and you can track those sorts of things. But back to the three ingredients of a remarkable firm, look great, sound great, and lastly, be great, you do need to deliver on the promises that your marketing makes. So website traffic. Uh, one of the case studies that I shared at ZeroCon last week was uh, OTM Group on the Sunshine Coast. Since we started helping them blog weekly, their unique new visitors to their website when they started out, they had a good looking website, so they were ticking the uh, look great perspective, but their content was just a static website, which is like a brochure. They call that brochure wear. Um, they're only getting a handful, it was about three unique new visitors each week, and they're now getting consistently well over 150. So they wouldn't know that unless they were measuring it. So with your website developer, they've probably implemented Google Analytics. When we say implemented, you've got it, but you might not be using it. So make sure you know how to log into your Google Analytics, and I'll show you some examples in a moment on that. And there's certain things that you need to set up, such as goals, which we'll explain today. Now, a very simple explanation, a three-part formula for modern marketing is you want to attract targeted traffic to your website. Targeted traffic meaning not tie kickers, not price shoppers, not the generic public, but people who are in the industry that you're targeting or the demographic or the age group, the type of ideal client that you're looking for. So after you attract the targeted traffic, you need to convert that traffic. If people don't convert, that means it'd be like if you had a retail store, someone looked in, had a look around, not interested, and they leave. So conversion means are they actually signing up to your e-newsletter or downloading a special report or an e-book on a particular challenge, uh, a thought leadership piece that you've put on your website where when they download it, they don't just get the PDF, they enter their email, maybe their first name, click a button, they get their PDF, but they end up on your e-newsletter list or maybe a quiz or a poll or a survey that you can uh, set up on your site, and this is what we show members of our Modern Marketing Academy how to do, using tools uh, yeah, like Formstack and uh, SurveyMonkey, SurveyGizmo, Gizmo, PollDaddy. There's a lot of tools out there, many of which are free. Um, other conversion goals on a website might be to have them play a video all the way to the end, or to click your social icons around connecting to you on LinkedIn or following you on Twitter or liking your Facebook page. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you can uh, monitor that are called conversion goals. So do you know out of every hundred visitors to your website how many are converting? If you don't, why did you spend that five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, maybe more, on your website? Because you're not measuring it. Now apart from on the website side of things, there's also email, but just to finish off that three-step process, attract targeted traffic, convert that traffic into subscribers and social media connections, and then educate and nurture them with great information. That's essentially what we help advisory firms do. But that must be underpinned by a focused strategy, not a differentiation strategy where you say that you're unique, saying you're unique does not make you unique clearly, um, saying that you're more experienced or more dedicated, more professional. Everyone's trying to say they're different in the same way, it doesn't work but you need a focus strategy where you dominate selected niches because there's a paradox, and I do love a good paradox of course, that by limiting your focus, narrowing your focus, you actually grow your success and you achieve more by doing less, which has got to be a good thing. So beyond that, then once you're nurturing them, email open rates. If you're sending emails out using Outlook or standard email tool, bum bum bad news, you don't know the statistics. Who's opening it? Who's clicking through? So there's open rates is a percentage that you can get when you're using a tool like MailChimp. We highly recommend MailChimp or similar email service providers like SendGrid or Campaign Monitor, Aweber. If your website platform has an e email broadcast tool built in, you can use those. They're generally not as good as tools like MailChimp, but if they're going to simplify your life by reducing the number of databases in your life, that's one reason to use them. But you can look at the percentage open rates, but you can also look at the percentage click-through rates. Now when we help firms with their blogging and with their e-newsletters, let's say you were doing two blog posts a month. When it comes time to do your e-newsletter, you can include, let's say, three articles. Two articles on the recent blog posts 
and another article on what's happening in the firm or important dates or things to consider for this time of year mm -hmm. for your clients. But with the blog posts, what works well, you would have seen this is the headline, same headline as the blog post that's on your website, the image and choose a, you know, a good striking image that supports the metaphor of of the, of the article and again that's something that we can do for you if that's not something you've got the time or attention to uh, to warrant. But then just include an excerpt. That can be uh, the opening paragraph or maybe sometimes a summary of the article with a link to read more or read the full article. When people click that link or any links in your e-newsletter you can look at the statistics and that generates leads for you. It allows you to see out of your email database which is more than your clients, and I'll touch on that again in a moment, but who's engaged? If you've got low open rates, you need to look at the subject line on your e-newsletter. All of these metrics are feedback. If you're getting an okay open rate, which might be 30% would be on the lower end. Any lower than that, there's an issue. 40, 45% if your list is mainly your clients is good, but then if your click-through rates are low, you're not really interesting anyone with what you're putting in there. And then again, you can ask, why is that? So what are your open rates and click-through rates? Now, social media. As I mentioned, we've been teaching social media um, to the profession for five years now, longer than anyone else. There's a few new entrants in the space. It's important not to overemphasize social media. It's a string to your marketing bow. It's not the be-all and end-all, but if you're going to do it, you want to measure your ROI. So how do you measure that? There's different tools out there, uh, things like Clout and Cred, that are sites, Clout's with a K, K-L-O-U-T, do you know your Clout score? That's a measure of your influence and reach. Cred, K-R-E-D, is a similar tool, but doesn't give you one number, gives you two separate numbers for your reach and your influence. It's all measurable. I'll show you later some uh, dashboards from some tools like Sprout Social and Hootsuite that you can see what engagement. Are people actually clicking on the links in your social media updates, for example? Referrals received. Clearly, referrals received is a lag indicator, but you should be tracking and measuring those either in a dashboard or a spreadsheet at the very least, perhaps even a whiteboard uh, within your firm where everyone can see it. New clients. Ultimately, that's where the rubber hits the road, is either your market share, how many new clients are you attracting, and also what we term your client share, which is a measure of how many services are you providing per client group. And are you measuring your client share? It always amuses me, and I mentioned this at ZeroCon on Friday, and a few people picked up on it, that most practice management systems don't actually help you manage your practice. They're really time and billing systems. A true practice management system is a CRM, which is about client relationship management. Because last time I looked, your clients are at the center of your business, not six minute increments and invoices. That's, they're on the periphery of, do you know your clients well? Are you clear on what their current situation is and what their aspirations and frustrations are? If so, have you documented them? Do you um, share that across the team? And what suggestions are you putting in place to address those aspirations and frustrations? If you're not recording those, you don't really have a practice management system. But um, a good practice management system is a CRM, as I say, but you can track all of these things through, through a good cloud-based in particular um, CRM. For example, if you're using a tool like Capsule CRM, it can pull data in from MailChimp, it can pull data in from Xero, which is one of the reasons we love the cloud, true cloud, where you've got interconnected apps where they're sharing data. It makes you a lot more efficient and gives you more transparency and knowledge, essentially, into how well you're communicating with your clients. So out of all of these things, and that's just a handful, where should you focus? And how do you gather the data anyway? And you know, with Google Analytics, should you care? Well, here's why you might care. And let me just check the questions while they're there. I don't see any right now. Let me just click that out. All right, so when you log into Google Analytics for the first time, it can be a little bit bewildering. A little bit like your clients, if you were to put a balance sheet or a P&L in front of them, their eyes might glaze over. Even some of the more sophisticated management reporting 
and KPI tools that are available these days, which are brilliant tools, I love them, but your propeller on your propeller cap probably whirs and spins around a lot more than it does for your clients. Their eyes might glaze over a little bit, which is why a conversation's needed. Likewise here, don't be overwhelmed or put off by drilling in further when you first log into Google Analytics. Um, so I'll just step through a few different uh, screenshots here. So the main navigation that down the left of the dashboards, shortcuts that you can set up, intelligence events, real-time data, what's happening on your website right now, and things around you know who's your audience and ultimately acquisition, acquisition um, of the results that you're getting. So it's pretty useful to track the trends over time so that you can see, for example, is your traffic growing? You know, where is your traffic coming from? What uh, operating systems are they using? Because you might think, for example, that all of your clients, uh, prospective clients, use Windows Explorer on a normal computer to look at your website. But you might find out that there's a growing percentage of using Google Chrome or the, um, accessing your site via mobile devices. And if that's the case, how well does your website um, render or present in Google Chrome versus Internet Explorer? If you're still using Internet Explorer, don't. Highly recommend you use Google Chrome for reasons I can't go into today, but there's a lot more functionality you can have as a business tool with Google Chrome rather than Internet Explorer. There are some rare exceptions. So just scrolling through here, in terms of the audience overview, you know, you can see how many page views, you can look at bounce rate. Bounce rate is where someone comes to your site and just leaves. So you want that percentage to be lower. Average session duration, how many pages do they look at per session? And a little later on in today's webinar, I'll give you a, a simpler view of this. I'm just stepping you through a quick overview here with Google Analytics. There's whole courses available on Google Analytics. And for our members of the Modern Marketing Academy, anytime you've got any questions about any aspects of understanding or configuring your Google Analytics, just email us at support at practiceparadox.com.au. As you know, that's included in your membership. But I'm about to step you through here the concept of conversion goals, which is essentially how you know whether your website is working or not. So the admin area at the top, when you click on that, it'll go through to which websites are connected to your Google Analytics account. Usually it will be one. Some firms have more than one website if they've got a different brand for financial advisory or a spin-off brand focusing on a different niche. But usually you'll have one site. Then when you click on the admin area, you can see that goals area there. Clicking on new goal, you'll probably see no goals when you go in there. It then asks you, well, what sort of goal do you want to set up? Is it a revenue goal, which you could do if you're uh, using e-commerce tools where people are actually signing up uh, to transactions with you, which you could use if you were using tools like Practice Ignition. You could connect that through to a revenue goal um, or an acquisition goal, people actually signing up, say, to an educational area or a membership-based area of your website or inquiry goals, are people filling out your, the contact us or uh, using a live chat tool, all of that is measurable. But you can see I've, I've put the red box there around the engagement area. So in the engagement area there, there are things like uh, whether they play media, whether they sign up, see that last one, subscribe to newsletter, or maybe some of the um, sharing and social connections where they, they click your social media icons. So let's say you chose the sign up one. It then asks you to give it a description in newsletter sign up in this example. And then how are you going to measure it? Now, every web form has what's often called a thank you page or a confirmation page that appears after someone submits the web form. So that example there is thanks.html. So then Google Analytics can show you how many times that web page is loaded because that page will only load when someone signs up to your e-newsletter, for example. So once you've done the goal description, you enter the goal details, so then you can paste in the URL, and there's other advanced things that you can do, such as what is the next step you then hope for them to do. That concept's called a funnel. If you saw me 
speak at ZeroCon, and if you're a member of the Academy, you'll know that we teach a conveyor belt influence um, concept. The conveyor belt of influence is built on psychology and technology. So the psychology is, multiple studies have proven this, that people buy not on the first sighting, even though they might make a perception straight up, they won't necessarily buy when they first come across your business or any business or brand. They buy after five to seven interactions or touches. So knowing they're going to buy after five to seven interactions, you can build that in to your website, your online digital presence across your site, social media and other tools. And that gradually educates them, shares with them your values and your beliefs so that when they inquire, they're speaking to you like they know you, like you and trust you because they do, because you've, you've shared your thoughts and your views with them. So the conveyor belt of influence there in Google Analytics terms is a funnel. So after someone signs up for your e-newsletter, what currently is on your thank you page? Do you have a video that they can play that you can then measure about whether people click that? So then they've taken another step along. Or do you offer an ebook there and then that they can download or a survey or poll um, or just simply inviting them to register for your next webinar? I know some of the people logged in to today's webinar with me now live do webinars every month on topics that relate to investing, zero and other cloud apps. So that's what the funnel there is talking about. And then once you go through that process and create the goal, you've then got analytics. So you can have a dozen goals if you want, but you at least need one. So when you log into your Google Analytics, if there are no goals set up, go back to your web provider and say, what's the story? Uh, you've never talked to me about our Google Analytics. You've never talked to us about our goals. Can you help us set that up? Now, if they draw a blank on that, which is possible, they might just be into marketing for pretty pictures. Reach out to us and we can guide you in some more detail. Now, there's so many good tools. This is one of the, one of the things that I love about modern marketing for you in an advisory business and also for your clients. Is there's so many great tools that are either cheap or free. Uh, this tool is probably on the more expensive end, but we think it's worth every cent every month and it's called Sprout Social as you can see. It's a social media dashboard and Sprout Social, it costs $99 uh, US dollars per month per user, but for your firm you might only need one user, maybe two, depends, um, but it saves you many hours of doing things manually and directly through Twitter's, Twitter's interface or directly through LinkedIn's interface or directly through Facebook or Google Plus and it can, it can pull in various data and, and it presents the information beautifully. So you can get a gauge with Sprout Social and I'll show you Hootsuite as well in a moment but you can look at what interactions are happening. Uh, the impressions is how many thousands of people are actually seeing your social media updates so you'll be doing into the different platforms. You can get an, get an idea of the mix of male versus female followers and, and fans across Twitter and Facebook and you can see the engagement and influence levels. So here I'm just sharing a few different social media profiles. Uh, you're probably aware and if you're not feel free to follow us. The at practice paradox in Twitter is one that's all about it stays very close on message around modern marketing and innovation for accountants and related advisory firms. Michael M. C. Carter, the middle one there, that's a bit broader in scope and that will talk about other things around broader technology topics, change management, visions of the future and a few other things. And M. C. on the Teev, uh, don't follow that one unless you love your sport and you happy to listen to an occasional rant. But I spun that one out so I didn't pollute my main um, social media platforms or my main Twitter accounts when I'm watching the football or the cricket. So anyway, you can get an idea of your engagement and influence and you can see over time uh, whether you are growing or not. So engagement are people interacting and then uh, the number of followers, clearly more is better usually. Now this is a screenshot of Hootsuite. Hootsuite is a popular tool and there's a free version and there's a pro version. The pro version is a fraction of the price. I think it's probably about a tenth of the price of, of uh, Sprout Social that I mentioned. 
And there's also tweet deck. These are ones that we share in module four of the academy in more depth. A lot of people love Hootsuite, and you know it's a good and valid tool. We just think the interface is too complex and too confusing, and you end up with too many tabs everywhere. For example, in Hootsuite, if you want to keep an eye on a particular hashtag, that's one tab that you look at. So let's say you were following the ZeroCon hashtag last week, and maybe still. And if you want to follow any mentions of particular keywords or your uh, mentions or our competitors' mentions, that'd be another tab. And if you want to keep it a look an eye on your LinkedIn, that's another tab. If you wanted to keep an eye on a particular LinkedIn group, that's another tab. And you end up, this is my view, uh, with a design background, is you end up with too many tabs you have to check. There's a tab, 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 tab. Whereas in Sprout Social, it has a universal inbox, one inbox or messages they call it and everything that you want to see is in that one. So you just need to scroll down and it can have hashtag mentions, mentions of yourselves, new followers, direct messages all in one place. Some people might like the multiple tabs that you know that when you're looking at that tab that's all you're seeing, in which case Hootsuite is a, is a valid option. So Hootsuite allows you to pull um, different analytics as well across different social media platforms. You can see down the left there, there's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can also look at your Google Analytics. Hourly click summary is their link shortening tool. You know when you paste in a really long link, might be a link to a website's uh, blog post, let's say. And you've only got 140 characters in Twitter, for example. By the way, big tip on that. Don't tweet, don't do your tweets out to 140 characters. You need to leave room for people to retweet you, which means leave room for your Twitter handle, which is your Twitter name, at your firm name, and another four spaces for space RT for retweet, in case they're doing the manual retweet where they want to make a comment. Uh, so yeah, in here you can get statistics then with hourly, that's their link shortening tool where you can see, and this is brilliant research, you can see out of the tweets that I did last week, last month, what got the most clicks? And that then gives you feedback to know what am I doing in social media that people are noticing, that people are caring about. That's essentially engagement means are people doing something uh, in relation to you. So that also allows you to test different headlines. You can do a blog post on your site and do various tweets that use different headlines or different wording to describe that. Same article but emphasizing a different angle or a different aspect of that article. And one might get six clicks, one might get 16 clicks, and one might get 30 clicks. Yeah, aha, uh -huh, isn't that interesting that that headline, same article, but that different headline and each tweet is essentially a headline, pulled far greater response. And then you think, okay, why? And if you can't figure it out, Ask us. For members of the Academy, a reminder that in Module 3, we teach you the FBI formula of flagging words, benefit and intrigue, which are the three ingredients you need for a good headline or a good social media update, a good line that'll get people's attention and uh, intrigue them. So that's Hootsuite as an example. Um, so pretty useful tools that you can just in the one view, see what's happening. Now one of the nice things, I've come back here to Sprout Social, you can see across here, messages, which is that universal inbox that I talked about before, reports that we're on now, gives you all sorts of insights into, for example, you know, how much website traffic is your social media use generating? And the way that we teach your, uh, teach your modern marketing is one of the main purposes, apart from extending your referral network, your sphere of influence, one of the main purposes of your social media is to drive traffic to your website so that when you've got a new blog post or something like that, those people are clicking through. So the reporting in Sprout Social is fantastic. So you can look across entire, a group is essentially your firm across everything all at once, all of the different social media and also your website. So you can look at Facebook specific things, Twitter specific things, Google Analytics, and on sent messages, that's where in Sprout Social, they have a link shortening uh, ability as well, where it shortens the links down but then tracks statistics on clicks. It's very, very 
uh, insightful. So, you know, here, here's a screenshot from last, at the time when I took this screenshot last month. You can see the number of clicks that certain tweets that we've done and forwarded have generated. Some clicks have got 900, or some tweets have got 900 clicks, some have got over 100, some over 63. If, I'm just throwing in some random tips here and there, if you're taking notes. Here's um, a tip. You can set up a quiz on your website, and if you've not done the two on our website, there's one, how do you rate as a rainmaker? So, how do you rate as a marketer? That's one quiz that you can do on our website. You get a score out of 100. And there's another one that you can put your entire team through, which is what's your profile, where they get a score uh, to a maximum of 14 across analytical, amiable, expressive, and driver. So it's a social styles profile that alludes to our uh, minder, finder, grinder, and reminder model to build a, ba build a balanced team. So we use Formstack to build those tools. I quite literally built those tools over coffee, um, sitting in a McDonald's. Bad, I know, I shouldn't drink coffee at McDonald's, but I was in a country town, it was the only thing that was open, forgive me. But anyway, built those, and then you can embed them on your website, and there's a little feature in Formstack that whenever someone submits the survey, you can do a little tweet. So see this one here, Diane completed our free marketing and rainmaking self-assessment score, 70 out of 100, your score, and then it links through to it. And the reason that's in all caps is that must have been how she entered her first name when she did the survey. Trent did it, Tracy's done it. That's a beautiful lead generator for us. So this, we walk our talk. Whenever we teach a tool, it's something that we use as ourselves. So within the marketing machine model that we teach in the Modern Marketing Academy, a refresher for those of you who are in the academy and a, a quick explanation for those who are not, within the 10 modules, the first module is your radar. So that's your strategy, who are you focused on. But module two, we call it your hopper. Hopper meaning funnel. And what we show you is that the purpose of your website for example, or your brochure, or your business card, or the, your next sponsorship, or your next speaking opportunity, or the next time you do your elevator pitch at the local uh, business networking group that you go to, is not to get a client, it's to get them on your conveyor belt, which means is to convert them into a subscriber. So that's the purpose of your site. So for us, that uh, every day, people do those um, surveys on our website, and our hopper, our marketing database grows. And I was talking to a member in Brisbane, sole practitioner, and he, uh, Ben, his name is, he was saying that every morning he wakes up, he looks in his inbox of a morning and he can see overnight, on average, two or three people have subscribed to his e-newsletter, either directly for that or by downloading an e-book that he has on his website around managing cash flow. Uh, so that's beautiful, it ticks over. Because your hopper is not just your clients, it's your prospective clients, it's your team, it's their, your family members, and centers of influence and referral partners. So if you're only marketing your e-newsletter, for example, to your existing clients, really, your marketing database should be 10 to 20 times the size of your client list. We can show you how to build that. It's all very methodical and totally measurable. So other things um, here, just going through some screenshots in Sprout Social. Now, clicks are one thing, responses are another. Here I'm filtering on responses, so where people either retweeted them or replied to them. Uh, it was interesting, that one, I reckon in heaven you'd be gre greeted with images like this. That was when I was in Gmail, on my, we use Google Apps at Paradox, and I got my inbox to inbox zero, it's very far from that at the moment, post zero con. Um, and it comes up with a little smiley face, and I thought that was kind of funny and a smiley face in a sun, I took an image of it and I tweeted it saying, yep, yeah, in heaven you'll be greeted with images like that. 13 people thought it was funny and retweeted it. And it's little things like that where people get a sense of your, I don't know, you know, the type of person that you are, the sense of humour that you might have. It's not all about business, business, business. Now so far, I've shared with you some quick insights into Google Analytics that can be a little bit complex, but you've got to set up some conversion goals or you're just running blind on your website. Also showed you some quick insights into tools like Sprout Social and Hootsuite where you can get some measures. But right now um, on screen, we're looking at a new tool that we're just rolling out. 
Uh, we're only doing it with members at the moment. Non-members can access this as well. And so marketing metrics dashboard. What this does for you in your web browser, whenever you click on the link, you get real-time data on your website's performance. So what we do is rather than quite literally the dozens of KPIs you could look at in your Google Analytics, we know based on where your firm is at, what are the most important ones? And we pull them through. We also pull through your social media and your e-newsletter if you're using tools like MailChimp where we can pull the data through. And in a snapshot, you can see is our marketing working? And let me just share with you a couple of little a case study. So here we are at the top. I'll scroll down as we go. Uh, and at any time you can click the drop down and, and drill into previous months. So here, total visits, and this was a brand new firm that was spinning off a different brand to target a niche. So total visits, 106. Visits from organic, what does that mean? Organic are people that have found you by Googling by doing a search. Um, maybe, sometimes it's not in Google, sometimes it might be in other engines, but basically they discovered you. So they didn't just type in your address and nor did they just click on a link that they've had bookmarked or maybe in your email signature. So this firm in that month period had 25 people discover them. It's not many, but there's brand new site. Now this is really telling conversions from organic, zero and conversion rate from organic. So out of those 25 people, how many actually converted? Now this means one of two things, either no one converted or they didn't have any conversion goals set up. So we then went back to this member and said, do you have conversion goals set up? And the answer was no. And then we educated them and handheld them through setting that up. So some other telling diagnoses. This is a little bit like going to the doctor and you know getting your weight or your blood pressure or having a blood sample sent off for testing that we then diagnose. Some other things that we could see, and this is a very common tale that we do see, landing pages. Now we've done some webinars in the past about landing pages. Here's a little bit of a shift in thinking. When you think about your website and does it rank well, stop thinking about this blob called your website and instead think about a collection of pages. And the question is, does that page rank well for its target phrase? Does that page rank well for its target phrase, which can be different? So your website's a collection of uh, what's called landing pages. So landing pages are where people come in and can also be where they exit, but where they discover you. Now we can see, looking here, that this um, website has no keyword specific landing pages. And another example I shared in a member meetup webinar the other day, uh, we could see that the only pages where people were coming in were either the home page or about us, our people, our services. There were no blog posts targeting you know, topics like um, business planning or cash, cash flow forecasting or uh, you know, cloud accounting topics that are specific. And that's where you get your more targeted traffic is to topic specific things. Like on our website, we've got a couple of blog posts. You may, may have seen them that relate to zero. We're doing a webinar series for zero tomorrow night, by the way, we're doing one, how to make the most of your new zero gold status. Uh, so that's a webinar series we're doing. We've written a couple of posts, one on that topic. So once you're gold, how do you leverage that and make the most of it? And we've got another one that's uh, 10 steps to becoming a zero gold partner a bunch of uh, marketing tips around that. Now, the main phrase that we target is marketing for accountants. That's the main thing that we target. But those posts have been SEO optimized for zero marketing ideas. And when you search zero marketing ideas, for a long time we were number one. I think that little company called um, Zero is now uh, back above us on that since they've released a few guides and things. But you know, we're number one, two or three, depending what country you're looking at, for that phrase and it didn't happen by accident. So that's the way you need to think. And if you've got a WordPress site, for example, you can use tools like Yoast. That's spelt like toast, but the first letter is a Y for yellow, Yoast. And as you're doing a blog post, it gives you a little checklist. It asks you, what phrase are you targeting? And you know what? That makes you think, yeah, that's a good question. What am I targeting? And then there's little lights that go, they start off orange, and once you satisfy the criteria, and those criteria, uh, what does Google search algorithm um, take into account? 
So for example, let's say you might be targeting um, zero training your capital city or your town, whatever it might be. So a combination of zero, maybe set up, let's say zero set up in your location. You can do a blog post that absolutely nails that combination of three words. So Yoast would make you look, okay, um, do we have those words in the title of the blog post? Great. Do we have those words in the web address? So that's called the slug, which is after your domain, you know, yourfirm.com.au slash, you should then have keywords in the URL or the, the web address. Google takes notice of that. Um, we often, with new members, see that their blog has been set up ineffectively, uh, where they only have like codes or numbers for the URL for the blog post. That doesn't help your SEO. Other things, is that phrase used in descriptions or alt tags for your images? Google looks at that because let's say someone might be vision impaired, their web browser, they'll have an extension they can click that will read out a description of the images. So Google cares about that. Are those phrases bolded or what's called strong emphasis? Again, Google notices that. How often and how naturally are those phrases used? Are they used in captions? Are they used in heading one? You get the idea little checklist and bam, you smash it. We've helped firms achieve number one for a target phrase within seven days of the post going live, sometimes within about five days. One that comes to mind is a Cairns based firm that was targeting two different pieces of software and an aspect of that and their location up in Cairns. Number one, and they're a brand new firm and they're now outranking firms that have been around for a couple of decades. So again, what you can measure, you can manage and what you focus on improves. Now, I've blurred out a few things to protect a little bit of data here. So uh, these guys need some landing pages. You can also see the pages where people exit as well. But have a look here. Average time on page, two minutes. Mm, it's kind of okay. Um, firms that do a lot of blogging and good educational content will have a much higher average time on page, but a low one, a couple we looked at this morning, had an average time on page so you know, how long does a web surfer when they get to your site stay? They had um, time about a minute. That's bad. So over time, as that grows, you can see, okay, people are actually coming and reading. So they're caring. Uh, bounce rate here is high, 52%. New versus returning visitors as well. You know, so you can make sure that you're getting a healthy traffic as, of new visitors, not just your, your staff and your clients. Mobile platform, that's interesting to see, you know, are people using the Apple or iOS related devices or are they using Android devices? And then you can see, does our site look any good as I said earlier? MailChimp, so you can see this is a firm that was using um, our article service. For those of you not aware of our article service, we have two levels. We have a starter level where you can choose an article from a pre-written library, a list or what actually works better is the custom article service where we do articles just for your firm, targeting specific phrases, targeting specific audiences and services. Uh, so this firm is using uh, our service there and you can see their open rates. So look at the one where they did there. There's, they've ranged from 25, which is not so good, to about 35% open rate, which is okay. Um, and then they're now starting to track their click-through rate at 5.2%. This also allowed us to see that they had a lot of different mailing lists in their MailChimp. Ba -ba Don't do it. Um, we can show you how best practice is achieved by you have one list in your e-newsletter system, but then you can use a field that you can make a hidden, that's the MailChimp term. Hidden meaning it's not seen when someone signs up, nor is it seen on the update profile form where they might be changing their email address or something like that. Only you see it in the back end. But you can have a hidden field that allows you to say, are they a client or a prospect? Or should we invite them to Christmas parties? Or um, you know, do they get the uh, financial planning related newsletter? Or do they get the one that relates to retirees? And that allows you to do segmented email broadcasts, which is very important. Don't send the same information to everyone. And what we invariably find when people have a lot of different mailing lists within their system, they're trying to achieve, well, we want to separate people out. But then you end up with the one person might be on multiple lists. And why I went bum, bum, before is they might unsubscribe and go, oh, actually, I'm not a client anymore, I'm not interested. So they unsubscribe, but that only applies to one list. And then 
they get an email from you, mark you as spam because they get peeved by that. That affects your future deliverability rates because the um, this mail service out there that are all connected delivering your mail will start to grey list and potentially blacklist your email domain or your website domain, which means your emails will stop going to inboxes and will start going to junk or spam folders. Clearly a bad thing. So we were able to see that through this marketing metrics dashboard. These guys were just starting out uh, in their use of Twitter, so those statistics are not relevant, but again, you can track as the followers growing, retweets, mentions. YouTube, that set up a YouTube channel and we yet to get any subscribers or likes. Is that good or bad? Well, it's just feedback. So there, we can then advise, all right, let's drive a campaign to your existing email list to say, hey, uh, we've got some cool uh, educational uh, videos on this aspect. These guys were targeting tradies. So you could do a campaign to target getting the number of YouTube subscribers up. Why do you want number of YouTube subscribers up, you might be asking? Well, if you're going to have a YouTube channel, the more subscribers you've got, the more traffic you attract whenever you add a new video, you can tick a box and they'll all get notified. Um, so it'll be come up in their uh, videos to watch and recommended videos. So you're, if you're going to bother to use YouTube, you can spread your reach and influence that way. So anyway, so we're looking at Twitter, uh, looking at YouTube, and we were able to, and what we do within the marketing metrics is decipher all of those things just like you would do for, let's say you've got someone on a KPI dashboard, you need to just tell them, okay, here are the key points. So here, it was no goals were set up, no keyword specific landing pages, and the fact that their email open rate was reasonable, but they weren't driving traffic to their YouTube channel or the website, so we gave them specific advice on that. And because they're members of the academy, they can also just put their hand up and say, could we have a member focus session, which is a web meeting with a specific focus. One question, let's drill into it and let's give you practical advice and implement. So that's some of the marketing metrics you can measure. We've got another eight minutes to go and in that time I'll answer questions as they come through. But what I'll do is just bring up a couple of other things for you. If you Google practice paradox and say marketing KPIs or potent KPIs, um, you'll see this article that I'll step you through. But let me just have a look. Tanya asked before, say that website again, please. And you did ask that 42 minutes ago, Tanya. Uh, was it clout before? Just um, send a more specific question again now that I'm 42 minutes on, Tanya, and I'll answer that. But I'll put out to everyone, just in case that's what you are talking about. So there was clout, K-L-O-U-T. You can get a clout score, and once you get over 50 in clout, that means you're really starting to use social media effectively. And there's also one called cred, which is a competitor to clout, if that's what you are referring to there. Um, other things that I mentioned today was Sprout Social. So I'm just putting these into the chat areas. So if you're not seeing them, just expand the go-to panel. Sprout Social and Tanya, I know you're you've recently joined the Academy, so you'll see this covered in Module 4 of the Academy. So there's some of the tools there. And Tanya's clarified, aha. No, it was the brand new client who had a great looking site but had not set up CEO. Well, I won't mention them by name, um, as just out of respect, but uh, it was, yeah, it was a brand new site. It looks brilliant. And uh, we'll get them on track with the SEO. So some of the things that we've covered today are in this article. Marketing focus, potent KPIs. And the preceding blog post uh, in this series that you can click there to go back to, talked about the fact that, I tell you what, there's a lot of KPIs like productivity. Uh, productivity, that old chestnut, that accounting firms spend a lot of time measuring. Number one, if it's percentage of available time billed, that's not productivity anyway. It's really utilization is a better description of that KPI, and it really it means very little uh, at the end of the day. So rather than managing WIP and timesheets, you can focus in 
on some more useful KPIs. So for example, and I'll just zoom up a little more for you in my browser here. Number of client groups. Do you know how many client groups you have? So not how many entities, not how many individuals, trusts, companies, but how many, essentially how many families do you have? Because really that's how many clients in effect that you have that you can educate, communicate, nurture, and ultimately sell advisory services to and deliver more services to. Do you know then, once you know that number, divide that by your revenue, and do you know your annual, average annual fee per client group per annum? If you don't know that, well, you, you might not be focused on that and tracking that. A member the other day actually called me and said, MC, you know how you got us focused on the lead indicators across our marketing and just business in general? He says, we just had our weekly team meeting, which is one of the methodologies that we recommend. It's a brilliant book, and I'll type this into everyone, called The Four Disciplines of Execution. Fantastic book that uh, talks about the importance of focus in a business, focus getting leverage on lead indicators that the team can move, getting the team engaged by giving them KPIs that are a player's scoreboard, not a coach's scoreboard. A player's scoreboard is where the players feel they can actually make a difference and score those goals. Um, and then the accountability aspect, focus, leverage, engagement, accountability. It's absolute gold. So we taught that uh, to this firm. And yeah, he's got his um, all his lead indicators are green. And we also put him onto a couple of dashboard tools that you can use where you can pull in data from, from Xero, from Google Analytics, from social media, and there's some good tools out there on the dashboarding side of things. But anyway, yeah, he was um, one of the case studies we shared at Xerocon that in the last quarter, the revenue was equal to the previous uh, 12 months. That's the beauty of focusing on lead indicators. The lag indicators will look after themselves. So client share. So do you know how many services you're providing per client group per annum. One of the great things about measuring your client share is usually when you first measure it and you use that, do that using a tool that we call the client share matrix. If you're a member of Paradox, let us know. You can just download that in the downloads area in the Paradox platform. Um, it's a gap analysis on your clients and it's a gap between what are you doing for them now and what could you be doing for them. There's so many stones that often just have not been turned over in terms of opportunities to do a better job ultimately for your clients. Here's another one, percentage of clients paying monthly uh, via monthly direct debit. I love it when we see firms and help firms get to the point where they don't do manual invoicing anymore, where everyone's just gone through a process where the engagement was done electronically, live using cloud-based tools, the invoicing the engagement, payables into the cloud system, data follow-up and actually the processing of the monthly payments. No paper created, no human beings having to type data entry, banish data entry from your business. It's a sign that your systems are outdated. So that's one KPI. We talked about website unique visitors. We talked about bounce rate, conversion, average time on site. You know, are you clear on your landing and exit pages? Clout and cred, we talked about that earlier. Social media network metrics. Again, if you're not measuring them, why are you bothering? Ah, Sean shared that she absolutely loves that book. Brilliant. I'm glad that you're enjoying that, Sean. And she's uh, thanked us for the recommendation. Aha, uh -huh. and Elizabeth's asked a great question that I'll come to. And Elizabeth, your marketing metrics dashboard is going live tomorrow. And if it doesn't, I'm going to buy you a case of your favorite drink because um, we're running late on that post zero con. So that's coming live for you. So social media network metrics, marketing database list size. If it's not growing every month, something is going wrong or more than likely something's not happening. Open rate on email broadcast, click through rate, number of inquiries, sources of inquiries. Often people wear, you know, we get all our business through referrals as a badge of honor. If that's the case, well, your marketing's not working. If all your business is coming through referrals, great that you're getting that. We're not saying stop getting referrals. If you've got an online marketing machine, you'll be getting more business through your conveyor belt of influence than you'll get through referrals, at least equal. Um, so are you measuring that anyway? Are you putting that on your dashboard? Can your team see that? 
in real time each week. Pipeline value, we teach that in module seven of the academy. Pipeline value, once you start getting an inquiry, a new inquiry every day or two, your inbox, your memory, your diary, the whiteboard, the flip chart, whatever it might be, is no longer a valid way, a smart way of tracking prospective clients through your sales process. So there's great tools out there. We provide members with a spreadsheet that you can use for that. But a good CRM system, you know, like Capsule or Infusionsoft or Nimble, they all do a good job at that. Practice management systems don't that. Uh, so there's full pipeline value and weighted pipeline value. And other things like your net promoter score. You know, do you survey your clients about their likelihood of actually recommending you? to their friends and colleagues. If not, why not? There are tools out there to do it. So Elizabeth has asked, we've, we'll just wrap up with the last couple of questions. Have you got an article on value-based billing versus fixed fees on the Paradox blog? Trying to get my head around the concept of value billing and throwing away timesheets. <laughs> no, then you put in brackets, you're probably going to say it's something in the academy, which you're a member of. Today, going live, and if I look out towards Bill, our chief copywriter who's just waved to me, we have a, web, uh, a blog post going live that's called The Write-Offs Paradox. Accountants wasting energy or the time managing the imaginary. There's been a lot of misguided but well-meaning advice to the accounting profession that I've witnessed over the last 20 years. The most prominent coaching organizations to the profession, I disagree with about 60% of what they say. Ban write-offs, you'll read about that in the blog post. It's ridiculous that concept of ban write-offs. Number one, write-offs don't even exist when you truly value price anyway. There's only a target hourly yield that you achieve or you don't. Um, write-offs is an irrelevant concept to a modern business. However, another misconception is that value pricing means price gouging. It does not. Uh, there's uh, certain coaches out there who love sprouting, um, you know, get as much as you can, you know, value price, so price gouge, uh, on tax planning. You know, if you've helped someone save 80 grand, charge them 20 grand for it. Our view is no, have transparent pricing so all of your clients are paying the same as the last client, the next client. Have your pricing as transparent on your website. That's got to be done very carefully though. A lot of people are putting up these packages where they're focusing on price. Um, and driving the focus on price downwards, which is a bad idea for lots of reasons. So we agree in value pricing in terms of price, not on the time that it takes you. Should your hairdresser charge you or the lawnmower man charge you on how long it takes? No, something has a market value based on your target clientele, where you're located, you know, regional versus uh, city suburban prices might differ, what niche you're within. And so we say give people a fixed price, but fixed, not fixed, don't even use that fixed. It's agreed price or it's just a clear scope and price. And Elizabeth, in module seven, no, module eight actually, module eight we talk about, you can't manage scope creep. And I know for a fact, looking in the business fitness, good, bad, ugly data, that there is a negative correlation between firms, last time I looked at the data, that do a lot of fixed pricing and their profitability because they do fixed price and then give away a lot of extra value and advice and effort. And time is money, let's face it, but you're not selling time, you're selling outcomes. Um, but the negative correlation, because they don't manage scope creep. So you can't manage scope creep when extra things crop up if clients don't understand what the concept of scope is and you don't train them in advance. But here's what's going to happen when matters arise outside of scope. You're going to hear me say something along the lines of, John, naturally when other items come out that are outside of our agreed scope, we'll look at whether we can come up with an agreed uh, price on that that's totally fair so you know what you're up for in advance or whatever words work in your scenario. So I agree with value pricing but not price gouging and ban write-offs is for, oh, I was about to say dopes, but um, for people who are a little bit naive. Uh, Michelle's got a question, do you have any tips on growing your database in terms of the new privacy policy? Uh, elaborate a little bit more on that in terms of the new privacy policy. Are you talking about communicating with your clients or are you talking about communicating with prospective clients? Because in terms of this, depending what country you're in, and I know Michelle, you're in Australia, 
you know, there's the Can Spam in America, which is a funny name for the legislation, Can Spam Act, and in Australia the uh, Anti Spam Act, etc. If you've got a relationship with someone, you can communicate with them via email, but you've got to give them an opt out mechanism that's there that they can click and that's hands off, and you've got to respect that and you can't re email them. Um, so just elaborate a little bit more there, Michelle, on what you're talking about. And Guy. Guy has mentioned that he thinks pricing reflects value. Uh, we, so this is Guy Pearson from Interactive Accounting and Practice Ignition. We took the Apple approach and ignore the race to the bottom. Worked wonders. Couldn't agree more. Guy and I are on the same page and Practice Ignition is the pricing and scoping tool that we recommend to firms because it's more than that. It's a full admin automation and payment processing tool as well. Race to the bottom is a, a phrase popularized by Seth Godin out of the States where essentially margins are squeezed, people are trying to be the lowest cost provider rather than the best perceived value provider. And uh, yeah, so you've got to be transparent, price and value, not time. Now we've got five minutes over. Let me just scroll down. Karen Hendry, God, you're a classic Karen. <laughs> Your hairdresser, you say, would be very rich if he charged on the time. T he based on the number of times you change your hair color, I'm not surprised. Uh, guys, getting off the ferry. Sean's off. Matt is off, and also Michelle's clarified. People you may meet at conferences, LinkedIn connections. You cannot just meet someone at a conference and then add them to your, let's say, your Mailchimp list. What you do do is you give them a call. You can connect to them in LinkedIn. You can communicate to them in LinkedIn. They allow that. And use a tool that we call, uh, we don't call, it's known as Text Expander. I'm just going to type that in. It's one word, Text Expander. Fantastic tool. If you're not using it, you're wasting 20 to 30 minutes a day. And so are your staff. Anything that you repeatedly type out, Text Expander, you can type a few little uh, letters or codes and it'll expand out. I use that in LinkedIn when someone connects to me. I'll go back to them saying, great to connect, by the way, how did you stumble across Paradox, how's business going for you? But I don't type that out, I type semicolon LI1, L for LinkedIn, or I for in, and then one, because I've got a couple of different variations, LI1, LI2, LI3, that depending on the connection, I send slightly different wording, and then people respond. If it's a card from a conference, I would go back to them and just, you can email them personally, and say it was lovely to meet you, uh, enjoyed our chat about X, by the way, you know, each month we put out a such and such, uh, whatever the name of your newsletter is, with tips about this and that. Would you like us to keep you in the loop about our new articles and webinars? Um, let me know and uh, we'll add you to the list. Words along those, uh, or words to that effect. One last tip on that, what we do is we actually send them a link where they can go and subscribe themselves because that way it's a proper double opt-in it's called where they then get an email back, they click the confirmation link, and then your email system that sends the emails know that they absolutely positively opted in. Apologies for going eight minutes over. Guys, we'll wrap now. If you've got any further questions, if you're a, an Academy member, just email support at, um, and if you're a prospective member, just get in touch too. Happy to have an initial chat with you. And we'll see you next month for our next webinar. Just have a look at any stage, you can come to our website and just click on, if I just zoom back to normal navigation here, the events calendar. You can see our upcoming webinars and also our upcoming masterclass in November about how to market, sell and deliver your advisory services in a scalable way. So see you next time.